welcome you on this beautiful evening as we gather, whichever part of the building we're in at the moment. We begin with some words from the psalmist, from Psalm 72, where he looks to the King who is to come. And he writes, May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. And our first hymn takes up that theme number 491, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. Now let's pray together. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be His glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with His glory. Our great and our good God, on a beautiful evening like this, we remember Your ancient promise, Your covenant with the created order that You have made that as long as the earth remains, summer and winter, day and night, sowing and reaping, will never cease. We praise you, Lord. You have been faithful, continually faithful to the covenant that you have made, even when we have rejected it and gone our own way. Your love is everlasting. We did not cause your love to dawn in your heart for us. You loved us 
before creation was made, before a star shone in the sky, before the continents and the oceans came into being, who loved us from eternity to eternity. Help us to praise you, Lord. We thank you for those who have written words and those who have set them to music and those who can play instruments to help us more worthily to praise the name of the Lord God. We pray, Lord, that we may mean in our hearts what we sing with our lips and that what we mean in our hearts we may carry out in our lives. Father, we come to you not as those who have made it. We come as those who have failed and who will fail again. We come to you from cowardly silences and rash words. We come to you from unkindness and thoughtlessness to those near to us and indifferent to those far away. We come in need of constant forgiveness of our many sins. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, could I welcome everyone again, whether you're in this room or downstairs or coming into the building. We're delighted to see you all and hope that you'll be able to remain for tea and coffee afterwards. I'm really truly thrilled to say there are no notices. That always seems to me an anticipation of the new creation. <laughs> in the new creation, there will be no meetings, or at least if there are, I won't have to go to them. Which, um, and that does certainly seem to me uh, consummation devoutly to be wished. I saw Hamlet a few weeks ago, in the case those of you recognize the quotation. So, no notices, and thank, be thankful to the Lord. Now, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing hymn 737, a hymn that comes to us from the great figure of Augustine in the early church, a hymn that talks about our longing for the Lord, and yet how we run away from that longing until He brings us back. Very beautiful hymn. O oh, matchless beauty of our God, so ancient and so new, kindle in us your fire of love, fall on us as the dew. Number 737.
Now, in our Bible reading, we are returning to the prophet Jeremiah, and we'll be with Jeremiah the next few Sunday evenings. So, if you turn to page 650, we're going to read most of this chapter. We'll read down to verse 32. Um, Jeremiah chapter 23, and we're reading verses 1 to 32. I'll probably refer to the other verses later on, but we'll We'll read verses 1 to 32. These are the words of the Lord and the words of Jeremiah, as as I said at the beginning of the book, the word of the Lord, which came through the words of Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, You have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness." Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me, all my bones shake, I'm like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of His holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land mourns and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil and their might is not right. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares the Lord. Therefore, their way shall be to them like slippery paths in the darkness, to which they shall be driven and fall, for I will bring disaster upon them in the year of their punishment, declares the Lord. In the prophets of Samaria, I saw an unsavory thing they prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And in the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with bitter food, give them poisoned water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has gone out into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you and to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart. They say no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear His Word. Who has paid attention to His Word and listened? Oh, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The the anger of the Lord will not turn back until He has executed and accomplished the intents of His heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. 
Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God, perhaps better not also a God afar off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal? Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What a straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send or charge them. So they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And our next hymn really carries on that theme 546. God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging word. 546. <clears throat> a break for a moment or two as we take up the offering.
Well, let's pray. The Lord said through the prophet Ezekiel, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. Father, how we praise you that we can meet in freedom around your open words to listen to your voice. We want to spend a moment thanking you for those whom you raised up and inspired to write these words, to Moses, who received the first revelation, and to all the prophets and wisdom writers and historians and others in the Old Testament times who drew deeply from all the words of Moses and applied them to their own time. And for the apostles, those who were there at the beginning, those who saw and heard, accompanied with and touched the word of life, and who have given to us this, the, these words which are a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns. How we praise you for the words of the apostles and the prophets that point so fully and so faithfully to the living word Christ Jesus. Now, Father, we know that there are many voices in the world every day. Not only does wisdom call in the streets, in the marketplaces, wherever we are, wherever we gather, with whomever we meet, but folly and also calls. And so often their voices sound so alike. Give us the wisdom by your Holy Spirit to discern your word. And we know that although this created earth of yours has a glorious future beyond imagining that there is so much today that it is fallen and evil, so much that needs the King who is to come. We know the Lord Jesus Christ Himself said it would be like this. There will be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, plagues, and famines, opposition and hostility. All these things would mark the time until He comes again. We think of the continuing violence in the Middle East, in Egypt, and in Syria. Think of the many places in the world, sometimes in the news, sometimes not in the news, where there is famine, where there is oppression, where there is, where there is discord and disunity. And we look forward to the day when the King will indeed reign, when Jesus will reign wherever the sun, his successive journeys run. Pray for our own land. We thank you for the birth of the baby who will one day be king in your providence of this country. We pray for the royal family, thanking you particularly for the many, many decades of service of Her Majesty the Queen, for the example she has been, and for the way in which, particularly in recent years, she has increasingly strongly and eloquently proclaimed her belief in your gospel. And we pray, Father, for, we pray for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge as they bring up this little one, ask that they will learn to walk in your ways, and that um, this little one will be surrounded by good and godly influences as he grows up. Indeed, Lord, for all the babies, for all those being born, those who will soon be born, we commit them to you, Father. We realize that you are committed to the future of humanity, your original purpose that humanity should fill the earth, should subdue it, and should be fruitful. Lord, you have never rescinded that purpose, and we thank you for this. We pray for the many activities still going on, some are, some are over, some still to happen, the work of the gospel in this country and beyond, the camps, the missions, many of our own people engaged in these, and perhaps to be in days to come in this land and in other lands. How we pray, Lord, that that gospel will indeed spread, be multiplied, and anticipate the coming of the kingdom. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power at work among us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and in eternity. 
Amen. Now, before we turn to the prophet Jeremiah, we're going to sing the hymn on the screen, which takes up the, some of the words of this passage. Jeremiah compares the Word of God to a hammer and a fire, and we're going to sing does just that. Now, in reverence and awe, we gather round your word. <coughs> Perhaps we could have our Bibles open, please, at page 650, Jeremiah 23, and we'll have a moment of prayer before we look together at this. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, let me meet you in your word. That is our prayer this evening, our Father. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear that voice, the voice that wakes the dead the voice that um, spoke creation, the voice that will one day judge the living and the dead. And we pray that may be our experience this evening. We pray that in the name of the living word himself. Amen. <clears throat> How do we know who is telling the truth? There are thousands of churches in this country. And if you went into different ones every week, 
you would most certainly not hear the same message. So how do we know who is telling the truth? And often this gets mud muddied up, doesn't it? Oh, so-and-so is such a nice person. He must be telling the truth. Or oh, so-and-so is so awkward and graceless. He must not be telling the truth. The devil is very, very subtle. I often feel the devil deliberately works through charming people who teach heresy. And of course, if he can also make sure, as far as he can, that the, well, the genuine gospel is preached by those who are difficult and angular, he's achieved what, um, to use a theological term, a double whammy. We have a very, very subtle enemy. How do we know who's telling the truth? And in this chapter, Jeremiah uses the metaphor of the shepherd, one which he uses over and over again. Other prophets use it. I read from Ezekiel a few moments ago. A metaphor that runs right through Scripture. Um, first used, I think, in Genesis 48, where Jacob, towards the end of his life, speaks of the God who has been my shepherd all my life until now. And the word shepherd really is a verb, someone who does shepherding. That's very important. It's not a title. It's a task. It's not something that you do as a job. It's something that's a vocation, uh, a commission. And the true shepherd is God himself. The human shepherd in the Old Testament is mainly seen in terms of David himself. But in the New Testament, the shepherd is great David's greater son, the good shepherd who dies for the sheep, the great shepherd who rises from the dead, and the chief shepherd who will appear in glory. And the human shepherd, if the human shepherd is feeding the flock, these great truths will be the very center of what's being said. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And at the end of the Bible in Revelation 7:17, 7, the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Now, when we think of shepherd, there are two elements. One is power and authority. The other is gentleness. And we need to remember both. If we are power only, then the sheep are in for a rough and a harsh time. If we have gentleness only, the shepherd may not be strong enough to protect them. And in verse 5 here, and in verse 7, there's a phrase used that's very important, the days are coming. This is projecting us into the future when the chief shepherd appears. There never will be a true shepherd on earth who can do all that needs to be done. This will only happen when the true shepherd, the great David's greater son, the king who is to come. But there are clear applications. Let me look at this passage. I want us to see how we are going to recognize a true human, human shepherd and how we are not going to be deceived by a false human shepherd. Now, I'm going to take verses 2 to 8 as the key to the passage. This is the passage where Jeremiah characteristically takes the, a picture, a bright shining light, and places it against a dark background I was going to say, you remember four weeks ago, we saw that in the previous chapters, but I'm realistic. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jeremiah's characteristic way of presenting the truth. This is what the true shepherd looks like. It's what the bad shepherds look like. So that's our subject tonight, the true shepherd and the false shepherds. The first thing I want to say is this, the true shepherd is sent by God the false shepherd is self-appointed. Look at verses 4 and 5. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them. And then verse 5, I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely. So, and contrast that with verse 21, I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. Very interesting, if you read the book of Jeremiah, the word prophet is used over 200 times, and more often than not, it actually refers to a false prophet. It refers to someone who is self-appointed, who have raised themselves up. Now, obviously, human appoint, human 
human agents are involved, or whoever they're appointed, whether it's by a congregation, a presbytery, a synod, a bishop, or whoever, the real question is, are they called by God, and how do we know? And that's one way we know the true shepherd is sent, the false is self-appointed. I want to develop that a little bit. The true shepherd is the one who listens to God. The true shepherd recognizes that he has nothing to say of himself. Um, Dick Lucas, who was here a few weeks ago and whose ministry we so much enjoyed, I wasn't at this, I wish I had. It went to one Christian convention and he stood up and to the horror of the organizer said, I have absolutely nothing to say to you people. And of course, you hear the gasps of horror and he says, well, let's turn to this book here and hear what God has to say to us. And that is one of the signs of a true shepherd. A true shepherd is not peddling their own opinions. A true shepherd is not selling a line, putting a spin on it. The true shepherd is listening to God and with all the imperfections, with all the weaknesses, and of course there are different shades of opinion, different ways of putting it, but verse 18 is the key. Who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear His Word? Or who has paid attention to His Word and listened? This is almost a definition of a prophet in the Old Testament. Back in 1 Kings 17, Elijah says to Ahab, Yahweh, God of Israel, before whom I stand, has said. The prophet goes into the divine council. He sees the Lord. He listens to His Word. Another good example, Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he has given the message, and it's the same message as Isaiah, go and preach judgment, because unless people repent, there is no hope. The false, on the other hand, have not paid attention, they have not listened. When I began training for the ministry, the first guy I was placed with told me, it won't take you very long to preach through all the preachable parts of the Bible. He had a very slim Bible indeed. The prophet Jeremiah, for example, never featured, I don't think, in any, anything he said. You see, this is the problem. If we don't have the full Word of God, then we sit in judgment, the bits we like, and we use these to judge other bits. The false are those who have not seen, who have not heard. In verse, 30, in verse 36, we didn't read this verse, but um, you pervert the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts. The question is, does the preacher expound the whole Bible? Now, of course, it takes a lifetime to expound the whole Bible, but this is the question, whether it's wanted or not, whether it's easy to hear or not easy to hear, as Paul says, in season and out of season, when it's wanted and when it's not wanted. And verse 29, the words that we sang, my word like fire and like a hammer, a hammer that breaks down stubborn resistance and the fire of the Spirit that brings life and warmth. The true shepherd listens to God to God, and as far as is humanly possible, conveys that message. Whereas the false shepherds speak fantasy, verse 16, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the word of the Lord. And judgment is written out of their message. The one thing a false prophet will never do is tell people they need to change. The one thing a false prophet will never say is judgment is coming. Judgment written out of the message. And verse 20, they speak only for the moment. Notice what Jeremiah says, in the latter days you will understand it clearly. They're not interested in the latter days. They're only interested in the moment. You see, if I have a disease which is going to kill me, I don't want the consultant to say, go home, take an aspirin, have a good sleep, and you'll feel better in the morning. That's what these prophets are doing. They are saying, it's all right, God will not judge. God's too kind to do that. But the point is, if they're speaking fantasy 
nothing will change. Nothing will change God's Word. No amount of special pleading, no amount of taking the word love, emptying it of content and saying God is too loving to do this. We'll see a bit more of that next week. The true shepherd tells it like it is. The false shepherd speaks fantasy and delusion. And we need to, we need to develop that uh, our antennae so that we can recognize that. Now, the second thing, the true shepherd not only speaks the gospel, but lives by the gospel, whereas the false shepherd lives by sin and unbelief. Now, that's coming back to verses 5 and 6. What will happen when the true shepherd comes, when the, the chief shepherd appears in glory? He will reign, he will deal wisely, he will execute justice and righteousness, namely the Lord our righteousness. Here's the very heart of the gospel. These are gospel verses. The Lord our righteousness. You can write over the letter to the Romans, couldn't you? And here it is in, in Jeremiah. Now, we are only human, but the point is, it's the righteousness of God which changes us, and the righteousness of God, which is not just the subject of the sermon, but the driving force of a person's life. The righteousness of God, which alone can save people from the anger of God. Remember the discovery of, great discovery of Martin Luther. He was terrified of the judgment of God. What he did not realize is that that same judgment was a forgiving righteousness, that there was a way back to God. It wasn't by penance, it wasn't by legalism, it wasn't by moralism, it was by forgiveness. So, you see, the true shepherd will preach righteousness and salvation, growth in grace and in holiness. This is a, this is a point that always marks the ministry of a true shepherd. There will be growth. Now, it may be small growth, Let's not, let's not get ourselves into thinking, oh, there's not very much happening in such and such a place, therefore God can't be blessing. Imagine what we'd have said if it had been in 6th century Jerusalem when Jeremiah was, well, we know exactly, we know exactly what people said, God has not sent him, look, he's not having any success, nobody's listening to him. Nevertheless, we, we learn later on in the book, there were one or two, particularly his scribe and friend Baruch, who probably was the one who preserved and wrote down these, the, these prophecies for us. And just as in chapter, in, in the previous chapter, 22, the good King Josiah had been described in these ways and contrasted with the false kings who followed him. This anticipates the new creation. When the gospel is preached, when the gospel is lived, the new creation is anticipated. That's, that's the point. The does this ministry point to Christ? Does it point to the new creation, or is it self-serving and self-promoting? Um, because the false shepherd will preach lies and will live a lie. Verse 11, um, both prophet and priest are ungodly. You notice verse 6, Israel and will dwell securely. Notice verse 12, their ways shall be slippery paths in the darkness. There is no hope in this gospel. And it's desolating when you hear this non-gospel preached. It's desolating if you go to a funeral of someone you've every reason to believe died an unbeliever, and you hear some minister pretending they had been a good and godly Christian. Now, by the way, don't misunderstand me. The Lord can speak to people in their last moments, and we don't know. What I am saying, though, is that um, this kind of fantasy and delusion does not lead to security and salvation. It leads to slippery paths in the darkness. And it leads, verse 14, to a lifestyle indistinguishable from the world. In the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen a horrible thing, commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All have become like Sodom to mean its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Uh, a lifestyle which simply repeats the world. Uh, 
A few weeks ago at disastrous General Assembly, a senior figure said every opinion poll taken is in favor of the gay lifestyle. Is that gospel or is that not just simply living the lifestyle of the world? We could get rid of the panel of doctrine, well, it wouldn't do any harm, and, because, and then simply, simply decide what doctrine is going to be by commissioning opinion polls. In an opinion poll, how many people believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? I imagine, I imagine the result would be an overwhelming defeat for that. How many people believe he rose bodily from the dead and ascended to heaven? You see, this is, this is what happens. And of course, it's all the gradual thing. People don't go overnight from a strong, vigorous belief to believing nothing. It all happened a long, long time ago. In the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, when godly and sincere men believed they could preach Christian ethics, Christian lifestyle, and soft pedal the supernatural elements. You see, when that happens, it's not very long before you get rid of the gospel altogether, because the only dynamic to keep people living the gospel lifestyle is the gospel salvation, which, which transforms. And once again, there's a key in verses 13 and 27, they prophesied by Baal. And verse 20, sorry, that's verse um, 13, and then verse 27, even their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Baal is always a popular god because Baal is the god of self-indulgence and bogus spirituality. Baal isn't interested in godly living. He's not interested in, in keeping the commandments. He's interested only in, in people living for themselves. That's always going to be a powerful combination. You see, there in every Everything the devil does is so subtle. The devil understands human nature. And the devil knows very well that you can pervert God-given things. He really will win victories. After all, it is, it is a, a, a deep truth that God has placed eternity in our hearts. That's what Ecclesiastes says. And therefore, spirituality, the sense of the other, appeals to us. It's also true that God has, that God has said through, through the psalmist, at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So you see, these two very deeply rooted desires, the desire for God and the desire for pleasure, they are God-given. What Satan wants us to do and what the false prophets want to do is to achieve these by illegitimate means. Sex is a great gift from God, therefore Satan will, will use it in a perverse way, and so on. So the, the true shepherd lives the gospel as well as preaches the gospel. And those who listen to the ministry of true shepherds will themselves grow in grace and grow in holiness. The false shepherd lives in a world of fantasy and delusion and leads people into slippery paths. Thirdly, the true shepherd, and this is the most important thing of all, the true shepherd knows the true God. The false shepherd creates God in their own image. And in this chapter are two of the great biblical truths about God. God the creator and God the Lord of history. Verse 23, and a man hide himself in secret places. Do I not fill heaven and earth? And then back, and then back in verse um, 7, the Lord who brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So let's take these. God is both up there and down here. No Cornhill student worth their salt doesn't know about the God of Genesis 1 and the God of Genesis 2. And here it is in this chapter, he is up there, and he is also down here. It's so important we hold both of these truths about God. If he's only up there, he becomes remote and distant. You can't think of any relationship with him. If he's only down here, then he becomes the cozy God, kind of God celebrated in, in songs, kind of Jesus is my boyfriend kind of songs. 
We, but if we hold both together, the powerful God up there and the God who becomes incarnate down here, then we have the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, He is big enough not to fail, but He is tender enough to care. Now, this is not a theoretical doctrine. This revolutionizes lives. When we realize that my help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, then nothing in heaven and earth can ultimately destroy us. Oh, there's plenty of things in heaven and earth that are dangerous. Remember Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, of course, the answer is there's all sorts of things against us, and Paul mentions them, tribulation, persecution, peril, sword, heights, depths, any other creature. It's who can be against us and win? Who can be effective against us? Now, that wholly revolutionizes our faith and our prayer life, doesn't it? Our God cannot fail. And then, it also means there is no part of heaven and earth where I am outside of His control. In great Psalm 139, when I was in my unformed substance in my mother's womb, your eyes saw me. That Psalm is going to say, from the cradle to the grave. It's far more than that. It's from well before the cradle, from the fetus in the womb to the eternal home at the other end. Read that great Psalm, Psalm 139. It also means we can't divide our life into segments. That was the essence of paganism. There is one God looks after my relationships, another God looks after my work, and God controls the weather. Another God is the God of the sea, of the wind, and of the storms, and so on. And a lot of pagan religion results in playing these gods off against the other. It results in a, kind, in a model and in a fantasy, like these false prophets. They, are, they don't think clearly, and therefore they don't teach clearly. So, He is the God of creation. The created order belongs to Him, and one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth where these things will happen. In verse 6, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. Now, the immediate context of this, of course, is the return from exile and the uniting of the two kingdoms. Now, the prophets never accept the divided kingdom. I don't mean they don't accept it as a fact. It was actually there. They never accept that this is what God wanted. And they look to the time when they'll, when they'll be united again. So, he is the God of history. But notice what, notice what it says here. In verse 7, Therefore the days are coming, so no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of Egypt. Now, does that mean they forget the Exodus? Of course not. What it means is they don't trap God in the past. There was a great danger of trying to trap God in the past. The problem about that is nobody lives there now. If we want to receive the grace of God, we can only receive it in the present moment. As C.S. Lewis says, the present moment is the only moment in which any grace can be received and any blessing given. Hankering for the glory days of the Billy Graham Crusades in the 1950s, hankering for the days of the Wesleyan Revival, for the Reformation, these were great works of God. And we must not despise them. These, these are wonderful works of God. There are many in the kingdom of God now who, who were converted during these times, both more recent and further away. What it means, though, what this verse means is God is going to do greater things. Now, that does not mean that we can therefore say, on oh, our lifetimes, or in the lifetimes of some here, there's going to be spectacular revival. The Lord has never promised that. But what He has promised is that one day He will bring in the new heaven and the new earth to which any previous revival, movement of the Spirit, will seem only an anticipation, which is what it is. Because one day, not only will the gospel go to all the nations, we'll sing in a few moments, all the lands will worship. That's what Jeremiah said this so often throughout his prophecy. He has a big vision. The true prophet always has a big vision. The true prophet knows what the end of the story is. The end of the story is not 
continual decline and defeat and exile. The end of the story is a great multitude whom no one could count around the throne of God and of the Lamb. That doesn't mean it's easy at the present moment. That doesn't mean there are not dark and difficult days to come. It doesn't mean there won't be apparent defeats. But you know, God's got a good record of bringing His people back from defeat. What happened because the great churches of which John writes to, or which the risen Lord writes to through John, the book of Revelation, these great churches disappeared. Antioch, Ephesus, and so on, the candlestick was removed. What happened to the gospel? What happened to the kingdom of God? Well, it kept on going. Whatever, whatever happens on this side of eternity, the kingdom will come. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven in heaven. So, the true shepherd presents the true God, the God of creation, the God of history, the God who came down as the Lord Jesus Christ, one with God who became one of us, the one who made that great and perfect sacrifice to which nothing can be added and can never be repeated. Whereas the false shepherd does not take God seriously, ultimately, because he doesn't take the Word of God seriously, doesn't take God seriously. You see, verse 33, which we didn't read earlier, one of these people, or a prophet or a priest, asks you, what is the burden of the Lord? Remember, burden is this word used throughout the prophets of a message, a weight that lies on the prophet until he's had the opportunity to deliver it. You say, you are the burden of the Lord. The message you are giving, which you proclaim to be liberating, which you proclaim to be be life-giving, it's actually untrue. It's actually a burden. Because you see, if we don't believe in grace, if we don't believe in righteousness that comes through grace by faith, then we're shut up to moralism, aren't we? We're shut up to trying desperately to imitate Christ. And of course, if we do that, that's our hope of salvation. One of two things is going to happen. One, we're going, to feel, we're going to feel we're doing rather well. And the other thing that's going to happen is going to be in great despair, as we know we're not doing nearly well enough. This is the problem with religion. Religion is deadly. Religion cripples. Religion is a burden. The gospel liberates. Religion says, do good, and God accepts you. The gospel says, God accepts you, for do good. It's not a world apart, light years apart. You see, this judgment is going to be set up for these false prophets who think, verse 40, last verse of the chapter, I will bring you everlasting reproach and perpetual shame, which will never be forgotten. You see, there is a judgment day coming when we will know beyond any doubt who spoke the truth and who didn't. There will be a day when the true gospel will be revealed and when the world will know it. So, just as we finish, just three brief comments. First of all, in back to verse 5, I will raise up for David a branch. In other words, this is living, this is growing, rather like the metaphor of the vine, not stagnation and death like verse 12, like slippery ways into darkness. Secondly, we need to know the difference between… You see, false teaching isn't something which on the whole the church would be better with, without, but can actually manage. False teaching is deadly. False teaching destroys. False teaching leads people to hell. That is the ultimate issue and the problem. We need a worldwide vision, don't we, how all the lands will worship, the great multitude that no one could count different times. Any of us may be in very small struggling places. Some of you may have been in the past in churches that struggle to keep alive. Others may be in the future. But the future is bright because the future belongs to the good, the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep, to the, great, to the great shepherd who was raised from the dead, and to the chief shepherd who will return in glory. And that is a gospel worth believing. That's a gospel worth proclaiming. Amen. Let's pray. (laughs) 
Our Father, we praise you that you alone are the shepherd. And we are the sheep of your pasture. We've also raised up in your kingdom people whose task it is to shepherd your flock. And we pray, Lord, that those under shepherds may be given grace, may be given vision, may be given courage to lead the flock so that when the chief shepherd appears, they may receive the crown of glory that will not fade away. Amen. Now, our closing hymn 508, I cannot tell how he will win the nations, beginning first of all, I cannot tell how he whom angels worship.
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip us with everything good to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and in eternity. Amen.